Well, please keep Acts 15 open and you were given an, perhaps given an outline on the way in as well which might help you uh, and we'll begin with prayer. Loving Father, we pray that you would um, teach us and remind us of uh, a very important, crucial issue. Bring comfort to us as well as challenge where it's needed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I were to ask everyone here uh, where they stand with God right now, uh, whether you are ready to face God's judgment right now, I'm guessing that there would be a range of answers uh, and that range of answers might reflect the different views on what we have to do in order to be ready to face God's judgment. What do you actually have to do? We'll see next week in Acts chapter 16, a man who knows he's not right with God, coming and falling at Paul's feet and saying to Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul answers readily, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It's as simple as that. But before that point in Acts 16, Acts 15 was spent arguing over what the church's answer to that question should be. Some people thought it should not be that simple. What must I do to be saved? Now, uh, Paul was an apostle and he didn't need the approval of the rest of the church in order to tell that man that all he needed to do was believe in the Lord Jesus and he would be saved. But because of the fight over this question in Acts chapter 15... Paul was able to give the answer in chapter 16 that now is the established doctrine of the Christian faith, uh, the orthodox position on salvation. We are saved through faith alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So as we look at Acts chapter 15 today, it might seem like we're just looking at some boring church meeting, but actually the most crucial question in Christian doctrine is being considered here on what terms a person can be saved from God's judgment? How can we know where we stand with God? How do you know that all you have to do is have faith in Jesus and you will be saved? How do you know that there's not some standard that you need to meet as well as, following, as believing in Jesus? How do you know that God's judgment is not creeping up behind you and it will get you if you don't try a bit harder to be a better Christian? and run a bit faster in your Christian life. How do you know that's not the case? We very easily get confused about this, I think, even if we know the textbook answer. Uh, we might fear for our salvation, and we might wonder where we stand with God. And the church, all through its history, has muddled this message on, of how to be saved. I heard of an Anglican academic in England who had this uh, hypothetical scenario put to him one day. Just imagine, a family member of an old lady in your church rings you in the middle of the night. The lady is dying. She needs someone to come and give her spiritual comfort. You rush to her house. Uh, the doctor greets you and says she's about to die. You go into her room and she lies there. She's weak, but she's conscious. She beckons you closer and she whispers to you, I've done wrong things in my life and I'm scared. Please tell me, what must I do to be saved? What would you say to her? was the scenario put to this person. And the academic's answer was, good question, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> now, let me warn you, this person's books are all through our Christian bookshops. He's a very popular writer and podcaster, but he has tied himself in all kinds of knots over the most important question of the Christian faith. We easily get tied in knots over this issue of where we stand and how we're saved. But there is a very clear answer to the question in Acts 15, which we see Paul apply in Acts 16. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. How do we know that that is it? Well, the issue comes up at the start of chapter 15, verses 1 to 5, we see freedom under fire. As you know, Christianity came out of Judaism, but the story, in the story of Acts, the gospel has now gone to the Gentiles, and the centre of Gentile Christianity was the city of Antioch. In chapter 15, verse 1, some people arrive from Jerusalem to say to the Gentile Christians, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. In other words, you cannot be a Gentile Christian. You have to be a Jewish Christian, which means jumping through some hoops first. Paul and Barnabas hear this and they object very strongly. And everyone could see that this was an issue so important that the mission had to be sort of put on hold until it was resolved. 
This is a fundamental issue. The people claim to be from the Jerusalem church, and so a whole bunch of people head for Jerusalem to have this issue out. When they get there, as we read, they're welcomed, and everyone's glad to hear what God's been doing among the Gentiles. But verse 5, it says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Now, were these Pharisaic believers true Christians? No, they weren't. They believed that Jesus is the Messiah, but they hadn't understood the message of the cross. They weren't really trusting Christ. And that really is the core issue with salvation. Who are you trusting? Um, If you know that Jesus died for you, then you'll be trusting him to save you. That's what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus. But if you add the need to keep the law of Moses or some other standard, then you are going to end up trusting how good you have been at keeping that standard rather than truly trusting the Lord Jesus. In other words, if the focus has shifted from what Jesus has done to what I do, then I've lost the gospel and I'm on the path to guilt and fear and despair. So the issue here is the very nature of the Christian faith. Is it just another religion, another code, uh, in order to prove ourselves? Or is it an offer of free salvation, a message of grace? So this big meeting in Jerusalem meets to consider this matter in depth and it confirms that the Christian gospel is about freedom in God's grace. And we see how that conclusion was reached here in Acts chapter 15, verses 6 to 35. The two big contributions to the meeting, as we read, were from the big guns, Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. Peter argues from what God has revealed to him and what God did among the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius in chapter 10. And then James argues from the Old Testament and what God had promised to do all along. Peter's speech in verses 7 to 11, we have it there. God told Peter very clearly to tell the Gentiles about Jesus. And when he did, God sent the Holy Spirit on them. Verse 9, their hearts were purified by faith, not by following some law. So verse 10, Peter says, why try to put the yoke, that is the burden of the law, onto the Gentiles when not even the Jews were able to handle that burden? And his conclusion in verse 11, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The Jews were not saved by following the law, so why should they make the Gentiles also try to follow the law? In other words, Peter's saying, we needed our tickets to heaven to be given to us for free, so why should we ask the Gentiles to pay for theirs? As far as Peter was concerned, To interfere with the gospel in that way would be to test God, is the phrase he uses in verse 10. That is, to really annoy God by getting in the way of the kindness he is wanting to show to others. The meeting then hears from Barnabas and Paul in verse 12, how God was blessing the Gentiles apart from the law. And then there's James's speech in verses 13 to 21. And James uses some very significant wording in verse 14. Based on what Peter has said, James observes that God intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. Uh, Significant language because that's Old Testament language. God chose Israel as a people for his name. Now he's choosing Gentiles as a people for his name. So James is saying that there is a revolution happening in the people of God. It's not about Israel anymore. It's about Jesus and Gentiles are being included as Gentiles, not as Jews. James quotes from Amos chapter 9. You see the quotation marks there uh, in his speech. God would rebuild David's fallen tent, which is Jesus, a king in the line of David. And people from all over the world would come to Jesus bearing God's name. A long time ago, God promised to do this. Now he is doing it, says James. So in verse 19, he says, we shouldn't make it hard for the Gentiles who are turning to the Lord. It's not about Israel anymore. We shouldn't force them to become Jewish. Let's just tell them to do what it takes to have fellowship with Jewish Christians and leave it at that. So the conclusion of this council underlined two things. First of all, it underlined that grace brings freedom 
putting your trust in Jesus, is a matter of receiving salvation as a gift. It's not a matter of getting on a treadmill and trying to prove yourself to be good enough. Um, Peter speaks of not burdening the Gentiles with the yoke of the law that is making them work for their salvation. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So being a Christian should not carry the burden of wondering whether you measure up all the time. You're not trying to become right with God. You are right with God if you have transferred your trust to Jesus as your saviour. You are forgiven, you're justified, you're free if you're trusting in Jesus. You have nothing to prove, you have nothing to fear if you belong to him. And this is the gospel. And the other conclusion that the council underlines is that grace brings fellowship. On first reading, it might look like the council has decided not to burden the Gentiles with the law and then turned around straight away and given the Gentiles four laws which they now need to follow. Avoid food that's been involved in idol worship, avoid sexual immorality, avoid the meat of strangled animals, and avoid blood. But what's actually happening there is that the Gentile Christians are being told to make themselves available for fellowship with Jewish Christians. So those four things don't build a wall that they need to climb over, they actually build a bridge um, over which they can have fellowship with their Jewish brothers and sisters. So the Jewish Christians, in other words, are saying to the Gentiles, we want to have fellowship with you, but some of us are really going to struggle because of cultural sensitivities, and we need you to help us. So it was a positive message, not a burden. And you'll see that when the letter was delivered, uh, outlining this message to the Gentile Christians, verse 24, they disavow the people who'd been troubling the Gentiles, Verse 25, the letter spoke very warmly of Paul and Barnabas and their ministry of a law-free gospel. Verse 28, it expresses a desire not to burden them. And then in verse 31, it says the people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. So they weren't loading law onto these Gentiles, they were inviting fellowship. So this church meeting in Acts chapter 15 wasn't just another church meeting, this was one that really mattered. This was a fight for the gospel. This was a fight for grace and freedom and fellowship. It was about the foundational nature uh, message and, and the nature of Christianity itself, freedom or burden. And it had a joyous outcome because it ended in fellowship. Sometimes I go to church meetings or conferences or synods, uh, things like that, and people discuss various points at great length um, and I, I wonder why I'm there. Uh, and I fear I'm also not very good at hiding my feelings on my face during these meetings. Um, I was at an overnight retreat at the Archbishop's house once. This is not name dropping, everyone got invited. Um, and the Archbishop came in during the evening meeting and he said to everybody, um, I can tell that you're all having a dreadfully dull time in here because on my way in, I looked through the window and I saw the expression on Steve Young's face. <laughs> I thought, whoops, I better... To fix my game face here. Um, but some meetings are worth having and some fights are worth fighting and Acts 15 was a good one uh, and a big one and very worthwhile. Luke then records two little incidents which might be there to show gospel freedom at work. Um, the first incident, as we read, is a sad, ugly incident which might be seen to spoil the wonderful outcome of the council. But it doesn't really spoil it, I would say. Maybe it's showing us that the gospel gives the freedom to disagree about things that don't matter all that much. Paul and Barnabas has, have a difference of opinion about whether to take John Mark on their next missionary journey, and for some reason it gets so testy that they part company and go on separate missionary journeys. Paul takes Silas, Barnabas takes John Mark. Neither was necessarily right or wrong, they just judged the situation differently and they didn't do conflict resolution very well, it would seem. Um, Luke didn't need to report this incident, um, but he does it very matter-of-factly. And the result is that two missionary teams go out into the world rather than one, and they didn't remain enemies. There was reconciliation eventually. We, we might call this a bit of a blip. And the church wasn't divided. People didn't have to take sides. I'm with Paul, I'm with Barnabas. They remained united in the gospel, even if it was an ugly moment of silliness. 
Some disagreements are deal breakers, like the one about how we're saved, but others can be lived with because no one's pretending to be perfect and silly twits can be forgiven and, and used by God as well. We don't have to be legends all the time. We don't have to pretend to be perfect. We're under grace. We have the freedom to be silly twits at times and for it not to matter too much. And that is the joy of being under the gospel and freedom. Maybe that's the point. The second incident then shows the freedom to be flexible. After this huge council confirming that circumcision is not needed for a person to be saved, Paul circumcises Timothy to make him more acceptable to the Jewish people they'd be preaching to. Was that a compromise of principle? Well, no, because the principle is we are free from the need to take on the law. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not, as long as you don't see it as affecting salvation. It doesn't really make any difference. So grace gives us the freedom to be flexible. Follow the law if you want or don't, as long as you don't see it as a matter of salvation, Paul didn't care. So this Bible passage overall, I think, challenges us to be very clear on the issue of salvation. What matters and what doesn't? What are the terms? What must we do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and there is nothing we can do to add to that or to take away from it. And that has always been the Christian faith. It's confirmed here in Acts chapter 15. We believe that it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus we are saved. Now, you and I need to be very clear on this. We need, in fact, to train in grace. If our gospel is that we are saved through, grace, uh, through faith in Christ, by grace, then we need to, to be very good at accessing that grace. Uh, I know lots of people who are training for various different things. I know some people who are training for half marathons or trail runs. I know some people who train in cycling on their bikes. I know some people who lift weights in order to get big and strong. I know people who are learning embroidery, others who are training in crochet, others who are developing their gardening skills. Everyone's sort of training in something, it would seem. But a Christian needs to be training in grace, which means getting good at trusting Christ for salvation. Because it doesn't come naturally to any of us, and some of us are really quite bad at it. There are three aspects to training in grace. Number one, we need to learn to be real about our sin. Those who think they need to measure up uh, will always underestimate their sin because they have to believe that they can get good enough in order to be saved. If you think you've got to maintain some sort of standard, then you'll always want to brush away some of your sin because otherwise there's only despair. I'm not good enough. But if you trust in grace, then you can be real about the depths of your sin. If you see Jesus crucified for you, you can admit that you are dead sinful and you need all the help. To train in grace, you need to be able to see more of your sin and bring it to Jesus for mercy. So practice that. Secondly, to train in grace, you need to learn to look to Jesus. Believing in the Lord Jesus means trusting him for salvation, and that means looking to him. But of course, the devil has various ways of putting the spotlight on us um, and how good or bad we are rather than on Jesus. You might think that the things that you've done in your life can never be forgiven. They are too bad. Or on the other hand, you might think you have been such a good person that you don't need Jesus. Or you might think that your faith is too weak to call yourself a real Christian. Or you might wonder whether you are one of the elect. Am I showing the signs? I heard of somebody who thinks they have to confess every single one of their sins and if they miss one, it won't be forgiven and they'll go to hell. Some people think that you need to display certain manifestations of the Holy Spirit or you can't say that you're saved. And all of these beliefs puts the focus on you and it makes you look at yourself and causes you to trust in yourself and what you do or what you show. But we need to learn to get over ourselves and look to Jesus. This is something you need to teach yourself to do. The question is never, have I done enough? Or do, even, do I believe enough? The question that matters, the only question that matters, is what has Jesus done? 
And that's, you need to train yourself to keep coming back and asking that question because that's the thing that determines your salvation. That's how to be free. That's how to live by grace. Learn to look to Jesus. And the third thing here is learn how to view others in grace and not put burdens on other people that God doesn't require them to carry. I think maybe sometimes our expectations of ourselves and each other um, make us feel like there are hoops to jump through before we can call ourselves real Christians. Like, even unconsciously or without meaning to, we impose a certain standard in this church that you ha- some people have to measure up to, otherwise they're not the real deal. And that puts burdens on them which God does not want them to have to carry. We need to think about that and the effect that we're having on other people and the culture that we have in our church, whether it is truly grace-filled whether that is the message that's being sent out. If you're called to the bedside of an old lady in her last moments of life and she tells you she's scared because she's done bad things and she says to you, what must I do to be saved? Just tell her that Jesus died for her and if she trusts in him, then she is right with God. Um, That's not just true at the end of our life. That is true at every moment of our life. And we need to train ourselves to apply it to ourselves as well as to one another. So let's pray that God helps us to, to, to get a grasp on this. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it's through the grace of the Lord Jesus that we're saved. We thank you, Father, that Christianity is utterly unique in that it's all about you saving us in your kindness, your mercy and your grace. Heavenly Father, we pray that um, you would help us not to muddle that message as we believe it and as we proclaim it. And we pray that you would be shaping us more and more as people who are people of grace, as you train us in receiving that grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.